Hi, this is Melinda with Martin Publishing Services, and I'm going to show you how the children's book layout process should work. So we're going to start with uh, looking in uh, our file management, and uh, this is how I organize clients' files. So I'm going to go into the Design Files folder, into the Interior folder, and then into another folder, <laughs> which is called the package. So when you work with InDesign, uh, after you've completed the layout, you package the file, and that puts your InDesign file, any links that were used in your file, such as the illustrations from your illustrator, which we'll look at, and any fonts that were used in creating your file. It puts them all into this subset. So if I open the links folder, you can see here are the uh, files that the illustrator provided. These are all Photoshop files. Sometimes your illustrator may provide you with illustrator files. This is ideal. An illustrator file is ideal because it is a vector-based program, which means images can be scaled up or down based on um, the, how the page layout needs to happen. They can be scaled up or down without losing quality. A PSD file, a Photoshop file, is what's called a raster-based software. And that means you cannot go any bigger than what the illustrator originally created the image at. This can be an issue if, the, if any of the elements need to be adjusted to be bigger than they were. Then that puts them outside of the ideal 300 dpi resolution parameter. So that's that's one aspect of this <clears throat> secondly um, if they do send you a photoshop file or an illustrator file we really need it to be properly um, layered and labeled these files are not layered correctly they they do have layers but it's not ideal um, let me pull one up let's pull this one up I'll show you what I mean. Now this is like, this is very um, a high-end way of doing things to properly layer and to properly label. So not, not every illustrator does that. It, the higher page your illustrator is, the more professional processes they're going to implement. Okay, so this file this has, in essence, it has four different layers because one is just a background layer that's not, I don't think that's even being used, yeah. And then this was the uh, original text that the illustrator had laid in on the page. Thankfully, that is its own layer. They didn't merge that, but I'm just going to hide that for now because I didn't use the illustrator's um, text layout. Okay, so this, see, none of these layers over here are labeled. And uh, I don't know which, which, what is what. So if I turn this off, like I'm not seeing, oh, okay, I'm seeing a slide. Okay, so that would be like a, a brightness adjustment. So if I want to go in and label that, I'll do that. This layer is just some embellishments to her art okay so if we turn both of those off we can see what we're left with all right so she does have the the girl and the angel on their own layer however she also has like the finishing details of the bench and some of the other embellishments are on that same layer. So what that means is 
I cannot, like if I wanted this illustration, but I just wanted to remove the angel and the girl and the bird, I couldn't do that easily. I would have to actually go in and Photoshop out and, uh, and recreate some stuff. Like, see this bench isn't finished. And I, there's no way for me to separate that from the angel and the girl. I mean, the artwork is stunning. I don't have a problem with the artwork. It's the process that the illustrator um, used. It, it's not um, as professional as it could be. And then so this then is we're left with the base layer. So how I train illustrators, um, team members, is... Everything should have been its own layer as much as possible without going overboard, of course. Like what I would like to have seen is the um, first do a layer that's just all the dirt. And then you do a layer that is the uh, greenery. Um, but all of the individual elements, say like the bench the girl, the angel, the bird, the the um, bookshelf, um, the fountain. Like, I would have made those. The, the wall, the wisteria back there, the little art um, easel. I would have made those all their own individual layers. So, that is a lot of work. And that's why, one reason why illustrators... Um, why the really expensive illustrators are paid what they're paid because it's more than just about the surface level presentation it's about the file setup okay so i'm going to close that i'm not going to save it because it doesn't matter just showing that to you so but so here's all of the the files that the illustrator provided and um, none of them were, were set up the way I would prefer they be set up, that the professional process prefers they be set up. But they're still beautiful, not hating on that at all. Uh, another issue was all these files were originally in an RGB color profile, and so I had to convert them all to CMYK. Not a big deal. I can do that. But again, that is something a professional illustrator mm -hmm. would have known to do. All right, so I'm going to pop in here to the document fonts folder. And here are the two fonts that were used in the file. When you see Adobe font list right here, that's uh, because fonts were used from Adobe's online font um, database. And it syncs up automatically when you have a creative cloud listing. All right, so now I'm going to pop open the InDesign file and show you the rest of it. So when we create for offset printing for um, illustrated children's books or offset printing in general, you want to work in four in increments of, of four pages. So this total layout is 36 pages, which is great. It's an increment of four. So I'm going to start back here at uh, page one. Oh, my thing was covered up. Okay, we're going to start here. So this is an end sheet. Um, or I'm sorry, it's not an end sheet. This is actually page one of the book. Uh, the end she sheet was created as a spread, but the right side of the end sheet becomes page one of the book, if you want to do it this way, like, because she wants, let me expand this out, okay, so this is her full end sheet spread, but the left side of the end sheet is going to get glued to the inside of the cover, and so the right side of the end sheet becomes uh, page one. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the next page. All right, here is the copyright information, her title page, her dedication page, and then she also wanted to include a This Book is For page, so that's in there. 
and then the story starts. So the story is actually starting on page six, and the story is starting as a spread. And that is where you have to have the left and the right together to for the story to make sense, for the rest of the pages to make sense. So what the how I have this set up is I have three different uh, layers that I work with. For this very top layer right now, I have it turned off, but it's just called the original pages. And I've turned that back on so you can see. So I just placed what the illustrator had done. This was the, out here on the parameters is the PDF that the illustrator had prepared um, through Photoshop. So if you remember, when I open up Photoshop, when I open up that file, which I can open it a couple different ways. So let me say this. Okay. So I'm just going to open this up in Photoshop. See, Photoshop can only handle one image, one either single page or you can do the spread, whatever, but it's still just one image. Um, one canvas at a time. So what illustrators do that think they know how to lay out a book is um, they're really doing it the most difficult way because Photoshop is not set up for a multi page layout. It's one thing at a time. And that means all of the text is separate. Everything is living separately. But in InDesign, uh, we're, we're working with multiple pages here, as you can see, and we can do hundreds of pages. Of course, we don't need to with this book. We just have 36. So what I do is I come in, if the PDF has already been developed and I'm having to fix it and, and, re, and lay the book out correctly and in design, then I put those pages into our... Um, sides over here in InDesign so I can uh, see what's going on. So I have a layer that is just the original pages and I can just turn off that whole layer and that turns it all it off for the whole book. If I turn it on you can see there's her original layouts on the left and right which is called um, uh, I think they call it a storyboard out there. Let me look at it preferences yeah pasteboard yeah storyboarding is what the illustrator will do before you before they uh, commit to final illustrations okay so in addition to having a layer for the original pages that I can turn off and on I also have a layer for the text and then I have a layer for the illustrations so I can turn off original pages I can turn off just the text I can turn everything off or I can turn on just the text so I'm sure you can see how this would be beneficial for different export um, different exportings that you want to do of your book all right so when I go back to the beginning of the story I'm gonna hit this button my control H and that's going to show me um, all my text frames in the document so you can see this little arrow right down here in this text frame. Well, it's connected. If I go here, view, show text threads, I can see that this frame is connected to this one. And I can connect these all through through the book. I, sometimes I disconnect them uh, just for different reasons if I'm having to restructure some things. But when the story when I first start the layout, all of the uh, text frames are in one, are, they're all connected throughout the document. And then I pop the story, uh, the, the author provides me the document as like a Microsoft Word file or whatever, ideally. If that wasn't done, if, if the story was never kept separate from the illustrations or if the editing was done after the illustrator laid out the text and then they, are not using InDesign like then it's like in 45 different files and it's not connected I usually just retype it because it has to go through editing and I need the text live and properly styled so 
but your story should be flowing throughout the document. It, it, it should be live editable text in its own frames. So you can see, yes. So, all right, so sometimes I'll start with large frames and if they just need to be uh, aligned at the top, no big deal. This one I broke down into smaller frames because of the layout. But I'm just going to kind of roll through this to show you. And so another thing that I do as, as, a, as a book designer, as an editorial designer, is I work with what's called paragraph styles and character styles. So here are the paragraph styles I use when I do layout for children's books. Uh, this text in her book is all centered. And so I have like uh, next page even, next frame, next page, same page, and then I have some different settings. So if I wanted to change everything at, at once, say I wanted to change even all the font at once, I could do that by going to my type, find, replace font. I could do that. Um, I, I could also go into my styles. Like if I go in here, I can um, change my font right here. And then that I can change the font. I can change the style. I can change the size of the font, the color of the font, the, how much space is in between each line of the paragraph. I can do all of that in that one place. And that flows through the whole document. Like if I wanted to change this uh, particular style to say I wanted everything to be bold. Oh, this font doesn't have bold. <laughs> okay, say I wanted to change uh, the size. Then it changes it for that style. And then it changes it for, for the style throughout the whole document. So um, you can see how that can be a... A huge time saver and it, uh, more of a professional process than what Photoshop or Illustrator provides simply because they're not designed to do layout. Alright, so when we, one thing too that a lot of illustrators aren't aware of the offset printing um, practices. So this book was actually, it didn't meet the page uh, count criteria for the way the author wanted the book laid out, so I had to restructure some things. This very last spread had actually just been a standalone page. Well, that's wasting um, money because if a blank page is still counting uh, counted uh, in your quote for offset printing, uh, even though there may not be anything printed on it, you're still being charged for that paper. So this was her original. Uh, layout for this page so we had to make this into a spread so I had to go into the Photoshop file thankfully she did have the angel on its own layer so I didn't have to do too much heavy lifting there but like each of these um, pictures in the frames they should have been on their own layer so they could easily be moved um, and should have had their own shading uh, attached to that layer but it wasn't it she had the background and the shading all on one layer and uh, the images, some of them were on their own layer, some of them weren't. So I had to go in and do a lot of restructuring to get, A, to extend this, to make this single page into a spread and to um, remove those images and correct all the shading. Like this is stuff that people just don't know about because they're not a book designer. <laughs> and so um, one thing I'm waiting on, hold on, I've, I've got this in like a, a typical display, so everything's kind of grainy, um, especially since I'm recording a video. I, I didn't want all my processing speed to be going toward display. I wanted it to be going toward recording. But even if I switch this over to high quality display, and it takes a minute, you can see it kind of sinking up there. So sh this girl is now very crisp, and I don't know if you can tell in the video, but the angel is just a little bit grainy. Now one thing that um, I, I can also do in InDesign is I can come check each image 
and I can check the resolution of each image. And so I can see here that the effective PPI of this image is only 171 and this is the angel only because I have her on her own layer over here. So uh, I've reached out to the illustrator to um, see if, if she had possibly maybe created this in a vector app and had just exported it out to Photoshop. I don't know what her process is, but if she does not have this available in a larger uh, PPI, or a DPI in Photoshop file, then our option is going to be for her to either redraw it so it is done at the correct resolution for the page layout, or I will have to uh, redo the um, spread so that this can um, be at 300 DPI. So, like, I'd have to size this down, like, that is 228. Okay, so this is right at 300 dpi, and you can see how small that is, which it was small in the original, I get that, but the original was wrong because it was costing the author money because the layout was not done correctly. So that is something that we're going to have to um, correct before we uh, go to final print. All right, so I think that covers a bunch of stuff for you. And another thing I want to cover is the bleed in the file. I'm going to turn on uh, my other panel, my other frames that I've got here. If I go and hit view over print preview, okay, so you can see that it made some of the stuff kind of dark gray. Well, this is what's, when the, when the printer prints the file for it to go, uh, fill up a whole page for the color for everything you have to extend the artwork beyond the canvas into what's called bleed and so yes it does get trimmed away but just like with all things especially when you're printing multiple hundreds of pages nothing it's not going to be perfect it's going to be pretty close to perfect but you have to build in that variance for when they trim the edges so that you have a nice flush even edge on your page and um, so the illustrator needs to be including extra in their drawing that is going to be cut away. And also we want to, another very important thing is the uh, illustrator needs to be making sure that there's plenty of room for the text to display uh, in a aesthetically pleasing manner. All right, I'm going to look at some of the different page, other page layouts, the other improvements that I made, and take that out of overprint preview mode. Okay, so the, here is the original that the artist, the illustrator did. Well, you can see how close that text is to the edge. Well, I like to work within um, at least a half inch margin. I want to keep all my text inside that so it presents well in the physical product. And I mean, her, like I said, her work was beautiful, but I've been doing this for several years. So of course I'm going to be better at it than her. And my skill set is layout. Her skill set is illustrating two different layouts. I'm not going to try to do her job and I don't want her to try to do my job because she's not going to do as good as me and I'm not going to illustrate as good as she does. Um, okay, so that's one area. Let me, I know I get used to looking at all the, the frames, but other people may be like, what is going on there? There's so much stuff. It's so busy. Okay, so not only does your layout person have, do all the other things I've talked about, but it's also our job, our responsibility to make sure that the text breaks correctly. This is called typesetting. And we want to make sure, again, that it, that just it helps present the text in the most aesthetically pleasing manner so you can see here like i i made the image of the the painting smaller so that opened up more room for the text and it just is more visually pleasing 
and here like in her original way she had the text it just didn't break she wanted to remember the words of the angel so she began to paint and paint she did down here at the bottom you don't really want to separate in children's books you want to keep the text together you want to make it easy uh, sometimes you may want to separate but there was really no reason to separate the text here so i put that into a block of four lines and i think it presents much more nicely there and i also she had this none of her shape here it wasn't a circle it wasn't an oval it i i didn't like it so i put that into a crisp circle and one reason i did that is because the rest of her artwork has crisp edges uh, if everything had had that uh, blur around it that would be one thing but i'm also looking for consistency in image presentation okay so you can see here the original text was bunched up i had to go in and um, scoot some things around in the photoshop file you can see how this hedge is just a little bit different um, I was able to reduce that to open up more area up here. She had the text stair-stepped, which I did. It's okay, but see this big, huge gap here, small gap there. I mean, that's those are all just things that catch my eye, and I think it presents nicer like this. Okay. Just kind of giving you a minute to kind of look at how I adjusted things. Again, here with the, the blurred edges, I took care of all that. And then I did make this illustration bigger here to open up more room in the clouds. Uh, because now we, even though we have six lines of text still, it was we need it to follow the same um, aesthetic as the rest of the text in the book. So I had to open that up to give the, the sky some space for the text to go. All right, and same thing here. I had to just do some, uh, some blending, some, uh, I think I lowered the, the skyline a little bit so that the text wasn't right up next to the trees. You can see here that this presents much better. The text presents much better. I had to open that up a bit. All right, and now that all of our text is in one document, all of our pages are in one document, of course it makes the editing, the revision process so much easier. Not only that, but when we prepare to do the um, the Kindle conversion, sometimes authors, I mean, one of the whole purposes of having a Kindle, having an EPUB file, is that the reader can control it based on their own settings. However, if you just do the uh, do it to where the pages are exported out as images, then none of the text is live, and so you can't. The, the reader can't control the size of the text with their settings. They are limited to, you know, this is the page. I have to make it bigger if I want the text bigger. Like, it's totally going against what the Kindle was even created for. So, when the text, when the book is correctly laid out in InDesign, the text is live. It can be pulled out. It can... I can turn off that layer, right? I can turn off that text layer and just export out the images if I want to. And then I can export the text out uh, to its own file because a correctly converted EPUB file is hand coded. Uh, so there's just a lot that really goes on that most people just don't know, again, because they're not a book designer. They, they don't think about this part of the process. They just think, okay, I wrote this beautiful book and I have beautiful illustrations. Let How do we get them together? And then they trust, you know, someone else. Like they hire an illustrator and the illustrator's like, I can do that. And so they trust that person to do that. And um, then I get the file and they need to make changes or it's rejected by the printer and they don't understand 
like why I'm charging $500 to correct this why well hopefully this gives you some insight and this is the interior for print um, it's usually several hours uh, that it takes me to make all these corrections and then we haven't even dealt with the cover so that's a whole nother <laughs> different video um, because there's all kinds of parameters that have to be followed for each different type of cover if you have a paperback cover that's one file a case laminate is a different file and it requires like extensions so that because when the half inch is folded over and glued, you still want that illustration to continue. Like there's just a lot going on. And then the dust jacket is a different file size with more space that has to be uh, controlled and designed. And then everything has to be approved by the printer. And so it has to be the right, it has to be in CMYK. It has to have the bleed. It has to have the correct number of pages for their process. There's a lot of knowledge that your layout person has to have in order to get your file print ready. So hopefully this is helpful. I mean, it was helpful for me. <laughs> so um, it helps me to talk through the process as well. And then the end sheets are actually uh, their own. Like if I pull up the whole end sheet file, I haven't packaged it yet, so it's still just living out there as a single InDesign file. But so this is the end sheet that will go to the offset printer. The left side uh, is glued to the uh, cover, the inside of the cover. Let me get uh, one of Jay's books. Hold on. Okay. Oh, I got to scoot back. Okay, so this is Jay's book, uh, Patrick Picklebottom, and like this is the, it has the dust jacket, and then underneath it has the case laminate, I'll just take the dust jacket off for a minute. Okay, so if we open up the case laminate, okay, here's, here's their end sheet pattern, and this one is just a pattern, so it doesn't have text or anything on it, but some authors do use the end sheets as like an extra page so because you can put text on it uh, like the copyright or different things if now that you know when you look at books you'll see them a little bit differently but so yeah this the case laminate cover you maybe you can see like the edge say so, well that's glued that's glued under there and then the end sheet is glued in in there and then this is the page one actually and then it starts the book, okay? And then the end sheet back here. So Wanda's book will have um, this page over here, glued here, and then this side with the carousel will be glued here, and that's like one, one end sheet printed and glued. And then page one is what I showed you earlier, which is just the right side of the end sheet, it becomes page one. So, okay. Let me know if you have any questions. And I look forward to growing and learning like we all are, hopefully, every day. And this is Wanda Roosh's book, um, You Got This. So I thought it was a great book to choose. Uh, for my video because I am self-taught and I, you really you can do anything you set your mind to but it has taken me a long time to get to where I'm at like I, I've made all the amateur mistakes all the rookie errors the first one being I thought it was going to be easy to uh, be a book designer because <laughs> I was already very technical and I loved books so how hard can it be right and yeah uh Mari says that's a lie. <laughs> All right, so y'all have a, a good night, and I'll talk to you later.